criticism from the public. All they get to ask is, is Mr. X a good doctor? Would you go to him? But we don't really know. So uh, in summary, um, these measures are becoming increasingly reliable, and I think they will try practice. Thank you. John Holland is who's been using them. Anybody from India? No, okay. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Is there other questions? I think we've got a gap here because Parak Sancheti is not here as yet. So what I've asked is um, John Holland to take us through some interesting extras. Okay, fine. Well, I'll, let me just bring up some I'll just put up some extras um, and maybe we could just have a discussion. Yes. Oh, well done. Where is that? Oh, yeah, we've, we've got the moment. So we've got Dr. Prasad talk about the evaluation of painful knee. Hi, good afternoon. I am Prasad, uh, A.S. Prasad from Kanpur and I am substituting for uh, Dr. Parak Sancheti because he, when he said no, the Dr. Maria asked me to present this talk. And I hope I will be doing some justice because this is a problem which will trouble everyone. A painful total knee orthoplasty, it's a very gratifying surgery, we all agree. Whatever we may do, 10 to 20 percent of our patients will come back and complain of pain and that becomes a problem because if it is failure of the procedure which has failed to serve its purpose. The patient do come for elevating the pain and getting a pain free mobile walk. I have just taken help of two papers. We all know when to how to investigate but these are the two papers. One is by Doug Dennis and one was as early as 2013, how we investigate a painful knee so that they can give a structured format or roadmap how we are going to do or how we are going to go about it. The most important thing, there has to be intrinsic pain. The pain is coming from the operated knee or it is com coming from somewhere else and that is a very important issue. If at all it was extrinsic, we must have investigated it before. But the problem is that it was shown in previous lectures. A patient comes with pain in knee, complaints of pain in knee and comes with limb. We think yeah, his knee has to be replaced. We forget to see the hips and the other way. So we have to take a very clear cut history even before surgery and after sur surgery if he comes with a complaint. A clinical examination, all the same things. A biochemical or microbiological examination and then x-rays and different modalities of imaging. First of all, if has come after surgery, we must exclude regions other than the surgery first. And it, the pain can be reported from the hip, a osteoarthritis of the hip, we all know it is reported to the medial side of the knee. It can come from a spine. A waddling gait can give rise to a degenerative spondylolisthesis leading to a painful uh, limb. It can, can come from a flat foot or dearranged ankle or subtalar joint. Neurological pains should not be discounted, they can come there and please we should never forget the vascular pain. A neurological claudication or a ischemic claudication, both can happen. So indication of primary procedure, whether it was inflammatory, a psoriatic arthritis, acute gout or rheumatoid, can it be a part of a systemic system in rheumatoid or diabetic neuropathy? If the patient has got arthralgias elsewhere in the body, so it can be a part of that. So we can exclude the operative joint. And there has been reports that a pre-op anxiety and depression, people who have that, their pain even persists after the surgery and they have got complaints pertaining to that joint. So these are the things which we must elaborate after surgery if the patient comes with the pain. Then the history of pain, how it comes and that is very important. If the pain only comes on activity, it suggests instability, a soft tissue inter irritation, loosening and mechanical impingement of any cause. 
it can be a loose body also. If it comes on walking, there has to be tubular femoral implant loosening and if it comes on stairs of getting up from a chair, pro probably the patellofemoral femoral joint is involved. And I can tell you the patella is still the most common cause of anterior knee pain in our scenario. Pain at rest will denote infection, most important if it comes at rest, comes at in night, a neuroma, it can also lead to pain, but it will be sensitive to touch, a cloth rubbing against the anterior part of the knee will create pain, so that you can diagnose. And you can always diagnose neuroma by blocking with a jalocaine. If pain is early, just it has not gone after surgery, then infection is the most important culprit. A malalignment or surgical technique, again very important. And soft tissue inter irritation because of overhang is again very important. So these are the things which can create pain and just by taking history you can shortlist these are the probable causes of pain in this patient. If it comes late, it, if it comes after a painless interval of good walk, then you have to think otherwise. One is a loosening of the implant. A ligament instability, especially in people who do cruciate retaining and suddenly the cruciate break. A polyvere because of excessive loading on one side. A stress fractures, even they can create pain later on because the person who has not walked well suddenly starts walking a lot after surgery. So that's again one of the factors. And a late hematogenous infection, that, that, can, that can also lead to pain, delayed pain after a very good period of painless period. Then clinical examination, we go one by one. Gait is very important. You have to see where, whether he is walking steadily on the limb or taking a limb. Coronal alignment, you have to see. A tibia malrotation, a instable gait, you can see. But always compare with the other knee because sometimes a particular characteristic may be of the same patient. So these are two very important things. It has to be compared with the other normal knee if he has. Look for the surgical scar and there is five signs which will denote that there is something infection happening inside that dehiscence, a dimpling or puckering, suddenly the orange, beauty orange appearance, rhythma, swelling and discharge definitely. It has to be infection. So just take care of that. There are sometimes allergic reactions just going beneath the uh, skin stitches. That can also lead the same thing. Effusion in the joint, that is very significant. And the first thing will, which will, which should come to our mind is infection. In our scenario, definitely it is the first thing which comes into our mind. Then there can be hemarthrosis, a secondary bleeding because of trivial trauma, especially if it is on anticoagulant. Most of our patients are on Jasperin and the trivial trauma can also lead to hemarthrosis there. A bleeding disorder if he has history and if he is on anticoagulant, which many, of, many a times they are on because of the cardiac conditions. Very rarely, it's just to denote a complex regional pain syndrome like Sudex, a loss of air, a skin discoloration, and shiny appearance. It's a neurological pain which will which the patient has. On palpation, the local you can see and you can palpate, or if you can elicit pain over a neuroma, especially in the infrapatellar branch of saphenous nerve, which is often cut, and you can test by jalocaine infiltration and can be treated by blocking that now. Patella, uh, there was a big lecture on patella and patella is still is the one of the most important causes of anterior knee pain. So there can be so many things happening there, but look for the alignment of patella, especially patella tracking in their full range of movement. Malrotation of femur and tibia component can create a sub subluxating patella or it can tilt and overstuffing of patella can be tested. So look for the patella and it can be a big culprit. So passive and active movement for instability has to be checked. If there is hyperextension, why? Because this it loses in extension, a fixed flexion deformity, that means it is not coming back into full extension, that means the insert which is fixing well in flexion is not, uh, there is not enough space, that means the extension gap was smaller than the flexion gap. These are all the technical problems which we could have easily prevented during surgery. Extensor lag, again, either we have damaged the extensor compartment, the ligamentum partially, or probably we have not, uh, the slope of the TBI is not right, of femur is not right. We have to test one by one the mediolateral stability at different angles to see the integrity of MCL. 
the AP laxity, if it is loose in flexion, extension is loose, it will it can dislocate. A flexion is loose, it can dislocate. So look at all those insta un factors so that we can pinpoint what is the cause and then only we can think of the treatment. Unfortunately, the, all the revisions are not so gratifying. Biochemical tests are basically done or serological tests to exclude or establish the presence of infection. CBC, the total count in the blood, ESR and CRP both are important but, but we must remember the ESR takes remains high even after 3 months of the surgery, gradually it comes back to normal after 3 months and CRP remains high for minimum 3 weeks after surgery. So these two things are there. So a progressive increase in CRP or ESR is significant but not alone. They have to be coupled. You have to think the, how the effusion is, how the skin is. And the most important clinching evidence comes from aspiration of the joint. You aspirate the joint minimum twice on different occasions, send, send them for culture and examination and minimum antibiotics should be stopped for two weeks before we aspirate the joints. Look for the color, if it's turbid, it goes more in favor of infection and the culture and sensitivity and it has to be done for both aerobes and anaerobe. X-rays are hallmarks, we always rely too much of an X-ray but surprisingly most of the time when you go back then you think that probably why you did not get the x-rays of the hip and spine done before the surgery because those are the most deceptive thing and I have burned my fingers once, I missed a spinal elastasis and the patient had to be operated for a spinal problems later on and that way back but after that every patient of mine even he may or he or she may not complain of backache but because of battle I get the x-ray done of the spine but anyway here we will have to do a long leg x-ray a lateral view, a skyline view, patella at 60 degree of flexion just to see the patella tracking. A long leg film will show us the mechanical axis deviation and coronal malalignment. So we can pinpoint the pain is coming from probably the instability or the malalignment part. Look for overhang because that will clinch the issue, its impingement. A medial tibial impingement will impinge on the MCL. A posterolateral impingement will impinge on popliteus and biceps tendon. A lateral impingement can be, uh, will not create any uh, problem, lateral overhang will not create such a problem. But on the femur side, overhang on the medial or lateral both, I think uh, is not permissible. You can look for the signs of loosening at the bone cement interface, which is very visible, and processes cement interface. If there is asymmetric gap on loading, that means there is a low wear on the one side, especially in the medial side if it is there. This location of the insert can be a very well appreciated on the x-ray but anyway it's an emergency also. Excess cement and frankly this I have seen it, there are so, so many times a big chunk of cement lying on the posterior side of the femur component and also on the tibia which could have been easily removed but that cement can lead to posterior capsular irritation a lot. And a loose body made of cement or many ostrophytes that can also be a precipitating cause of leading to effusion and synovitis and pain. We have to look for patella alta and baha and over stuffing in the resurface patella in the lateral view of patella. A skyline view of patella will show us malalignment, a tilting, a lucency, arthritic changes especially in a resurface patella the lateral bone which is left that can, there can be osteophytes and which can be rubbing against the femoral component leading to pain. So, Look for significant radiolucencies. I make it a point because there's so, so many times you find a small radiolucent areas between the tibia plate and the bone. Those are not significant. If there are progressive lucencies which keep on increasing the size and they are significant, means the size is more than 4 millimeter in one go, then probably you have to keep them under observation. Alone they do not warrant any other thing excepting observation. CT scan and 3D reconstruction that is one of the important hallmarks to look for the alignment especially the scanogram which will show us very well how the mechanical axis and anatomical axis differ. So I think this is one of the important things just to see how the mechanics of the joint has changed. If you have got a previous record you can obviously compare that yes it has gone from this angle and the now deviation is there. So it is one of the good things which has happened and now frankly we are getting the long leg x-rays also with the rotation which has been marked.
There are so many other modalities which we can go for. MRI is not very helpful, but yes, it, you can get it done. Radionuclide imaging, again, after a stress fracture, after infection, and after losing. Both the time, all the time, it will give the same results. So, not very conclusive, but it will tell us that the joint is loose. The cause may be septic, cause may be mechanics also. Arthrography, again, not being used. Orthoscopy is being practiced, especially in the patellar cl clunk syndrome for both diagnosing and treating. Not very easy. I have done a couple of them, so it's not easy. It's very tight tissue. Yes, but it is one of the things which we can do. So, these are the things which we can do to establish a painful joint. But most important, we must ensure that we do not land into this situation. And that is the crux of the talks which you had earlier, so that if the technique is good, you know all the basics, probably most of us, our patients will not get it. Thanks. Thanks a lot. CT scan, CT scan will give you a lot, lot of artifacts, but the newer CT scan, they take cover off of that. They can eliminate those and can give you a good access, good orientation of the joint and 3D reconstruction will give you absolutely how much coronal rotation is also there. For infection, aspiration is the key. First thing you must do aspiration, do it once and do it second time on two different occasions and then send it for culture and microscopic. MRI will tell you that there is some collection and uh, uh, the fluid collection which can happen in aseptic situations also and the loosening, that's all. MRI do not. Yeah. Earliest how, how X I, by, by seeing the X-ray, how <coughs> do I understand there is presence of infection? Earliest, no, earliest, earliest there is no early sign because in X-ray you will get only late sign when the there is osteolysis of the tibia or femur. Uh, you can see and that most of the time it is masked also, especially in the femur. So that is not the early sign. For early sign, aspiration is the key. High degree of suspicion, that is number one. The associated like uh, CBC, ESR, CRP, if it is rising. Stop antibiotics and then do as aspirate and it is for both. Trying to exclude the infection also, aspiration is a very good trick. There's still about 18 to 20 percent false negatives with aspiration at least. Yeah. Yeah, there, 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 there are two new things with infection. One is <coughs> there's a new test that Jay Provitzi uh, devised which is effectively an immunological test for an enzyme. And the other thing is SPECT-CT, which is positron emission CT. <coughs> We don't really know with spec CT what's infection, what's losing, but they do have seen <coughs> some images. So they just need to keep an eye out on the horizon for those. But otherwise, aspiration and biopsy, wow. tissue biopsy, gives you a better yield. I think in our clinical, I think that's Jim exactly right, it was in our clinical scenario. It's more about clinical suspicion, clinical examination, and then uh, aspiration. That two in the aseptic conditions in theatres. I won't do them in the outpatient or clinics. Okay. I think it needs to be five by five. Yes. Yes. From either corner. I do it through the arthroscope. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. Any other questions? That's the case. We'll move on to the next speaker. We've got uh, Dr. Sanjeev Maria, the president himself, the dawn of IUA. Come and talk to us about revision to the arthroplasty. Thanks, Ajay. And Thanks, Amal, for actually substituting at a short notice and uh, covering the painful total knee. I'm going to now introduce you to the very basics of you have a situation where you need to revise this joint and what all you need bare minimum and what, how you're going to approach this situation. This is going to be largely on the aseptic arena because septic means you have to do it twice. You have to remove it, clean it up, put antibiotic loaded cement and then 
your back to your implants have been removed with certain changes etc that's a different issue now let's just go down to uh, why should there be aseptic loosening it is due to biological factors when <coughs> the insert wears small pieces of polyethylene will float all around they'll go at the bone cement interface and the implant cement interface and then the body will react and macrophages will go and try and eat this up these particles and while it takes a bite of these particles it'll also take bites out of the bone and when it starts doing that it starts making it loose so it's the body reaction the foreign body reaction which makes it loose and if you're using uncemented implants one of the causes is that the bone has not actually grown into the implant the uncemented implants in knee are not very common but this has to be put in here for completion sake the causes of failure are broadly a poor quality of implant a poorly put implant poorly selected patient and poorly performed operation i wanted somebody had asked a question in the morning so luckily this is one of those big grafts which has started failing you asked in the morning that would you put bulk allo graft this is a auto in fact not even allo this is the patient's own bone graft of very nice previous x-rays and over a few years you find it starts bending down <coughs> it also means that it may not have been perfect alignment and at that stage what was missing in what is poor here poor technique poor assessment poor analysis is that a intramedullary stem was not put if that was put so this is poor judgment and poor execution mechanical failure we heard in one of the talks that earlier the polys used to be thin now minimum you need is 8 mm and most manufacturers don't provide less than that if they are you shouldn't be buying it second thing is the quality is improving They're going more towards a uh, cross linked polys the role of cross link poly in hip and knee is different but we heard that we have a certain advantage and disadvantage in both but broadly the forces on the knee are compressive forces and the forces on the hip are more abrasive and more shear forces unless you put it in bad alignment in any of them the other thing is that if you have fixation to poor quality of bone and you haven't fixed it properly this is also likely to fail so the technique if your technique is bad you have bad alignment you put the component badly look at this is a badly put component it's all stuffed in badly and the soft tissue balance is not good you're going to have early failure the important thing is to determine what caused this failure and not just take this patient in and try and sort it out because not only do you have to reverse the problem which caused this problem but you've also got to try and learn from this and not repeat this in another patient which quite often i have seen in my own hands so then comes evaluating and planning for such a patient you look at all the prior surgical scars you look at the status of extensor mechanism patellar tracking <coughs> most important thing is look at if the patellar tendon is ruptured try clinical assessment if you are in doubt <coughs> ultrasound helps now it's very, and the status of collaterals if you can define them because this will help you choose the type of implant you want to use it's very important not only to see these and assess these but to document them clearly on your files because sooner or later you are going to be blamed for something which you didn't do if you create a complication you can cope with it because you can say okay i made a mistake maybe i need some punishment but it's worse if you made the mistake of not examining and documenting it and being blamed for something which you haven't done radiographs like everything else are very important we've been hearing since the morning it helps to see what do the bones look like have they had prior fractures at some stage one used to take this of the opposite limb to uh, you know template the sizes these days it's a huge problem because you do not have standard x-rays and more so the digital x-rays as we heard in the morning are way out 
digital x-rays you cannot calculate but uh, we are expecting that we are on the horizon of perhaps being having methods of being able to evaluate on digital x-rays separately with separate ways but at the moment no no and what we do is we rely on our assessment on the table yeah. so the corollary of this is that if you have got to decide what is the size on the table then you need to have all the sizes available you will be amazed that you'll say oh this looks like size 2 and when you go in it will be size 4 and vice versa and that and you actually arranged for you know that old philosophy of fix it one joint above one joint below you cover with the plaster you say okay I have measured two one joint above one below but it turns up two above on the operating table and it happens now what is the aim of revision surgery this is one line which is the most important in this the aim is to restore the dimensions of the joint and the joint line with soft tissue balance that is the gap balance you could have subtle loosening well this is a little more than subtle on the x-ray which could be with low grade infection now this is the most difficult part when there is low grade infection you can find nothing CRP where the upper limit should be 1 it is 1.3 no temperature 5 or 55 aspiration showing nothing but you are not sure whether it is aseptic or septic this is where the biggest problem arises and you obviously do take a good history blood test aspiration bone scan leukocyte tag that is and a swab on the table and send for gram staining if you are absolutely confused and you don't know what to do you should have discussed this with the patient before going in and taken a consent for a two stage you can say that if you are sure you will do one but otherwise if on the table you are still unsure go ahead and do a two stage both for patients and your own sake then comes <clears throat> the issue of tackling bone stock look at this when you remove the patella this is one of those the big hole left behind and for a patella which is less than 12 millimeters it's very difficult to put a button over it you either just do a patelloplasty shave it out a bit and leave it alone patellectomy is almost a no-no if you have any bit of bone left try not to remove it there are ways of reconstructing with putting titanium mesh and putting bone into it folding it over itself and waiting for a patella to grow it but <clears throat> it's not a day to day routine it's for completion sake and if you are the only center and getting all the referrals maybe then but most important thing is on the table you need to keep extensions augments and grafts How many of you know Pamela Anderson by then? Huh? There's a serious problem here. <laughs> and how many know Bipasha Basu for that matter? Okay, that should have woken up some of you. We'll go go ahead. Now we'll talk about extensions. <coughs> Amal actually responded the fastest. And we gave him a present after this, nonetheless. So in terms of using extensions that is you want to put these rods to the femoral and the tibial side there are two ways that you can have cemented or uncemented there are arguments for both cemented were doing very well till uncemented came in perhaps you are not cementing them well enough but at the same time there is specific indication for cemented that is in elderly osteoporotics who need immediate fixation and who need to be mobilized quickly and who uh, you can't play God but you think few years and when you use massive allografts like this one this is a big allograft at the same time uncemented are good the problem with cemented is that if you fix it and it gets fixed at the bottom you will have stress shielding at the top and the bone will start getting weaker just below the implant the press fit which goes right down and is fitting properly that is the uncemented would probably obviate this particular problem but they are far more expensive now <clears throat> you made up everything you know what is going on now you are coming out how to actually do a basic revision you have got you have found out what it is it is a loose aseptic implant 
you've got to go in four steps. First thing is to expose the knee properly. Next step is to remove these implants without being a bull in a china shop. You don't just want to rape the whole bone. Next is preparation of this bone to put the new implant on it. And finally is that you've got the new prosthesis which has to be put on this nicely prepared. So all these steps are interlinked. <clears throat> you take a shortcut in any of these, you're going to be in trouble. So let's talk about exposure. We've already said, in most instances, if there is one incision, it's ideal to use the old incision. If there are multiple incision, use the lateral most to leave behind maximum blood supply coming from the medial side. So the least chances of skin necrosis. And when you're making this cut, you've got to just cut down to the implant. Just And you're safe here because it's highly unlikely that you can cut through the femoral implant. So you just go straight down, cut down, and you should feel the implant with your skin knife. You Then you do the arthrotomy. You open it up. More often than not here, normally you don't discuss about fancy approaches. You discuss about a straight butcher's approach. Cut down straight medial parapetella to get a nice good exposure and do a sharp dissection. Use a knife. Then you need to define the gutters. Everything is sort of in some cases stuck to the sides of the lower femur and upper tibia and at times it may not be so badly stuck if the patient has been moving the knee sufficiently. But <coughs> the lat you need to do a lateral retinacular release. Here we can use a diathermy or cautery. But if you are using a diathermy, then don't think you are using a knife because with a knife you want to go fast, with a diathermy you want to go slow. When you are going slow, you at least give the time to coagulate the vessel that you are trying to avoid from bleeding. If you are going to cut it very fast, you are going to leave small bleeders behind. But nonetheless, you use the diathermy on both sides and you will form a medial sleeve as you normally do in case of severe virus. In the lower picture, uh, you can see that we have cut, but at this stage, you take your first culture. At least three cultures, five is a luxury, but minimum three have to be taken from the different sites. One is here, the other two we normally take removing the femoral and the tibial implants and from their bases, because that's where bacteria normally hide, if there are any. Now, we heard in the morning a question, I'll show you how it is done, but you have to, in these, you quite often find that this patellar ligament here at the bottom is adherent to the upper tibia, and when you're releasing this, do a controlled release yourself. Don't try that to release it by as it happens along the way. That I'll evert or reflect the patella and then I'll flex it and whatever has to happen will happen and when that happens then you wish it didn't happen. So bottom line is that you release it a bit either with a diathermy or with a knife up to 25-30% no problem. You do a controlled release. Do not evert the patella normally in a revision because that can quite often come off the tibial tubercle and that's a nightmare. In fact, the single worst complication is a patellar revulsion and it's a toss up bit up between patellar revulsion and infection which is worse but infection you can blame somebody else or luck but patellar revulsion you'll probably have difficulty escaping. Anyway, for if, at times if you're finding it difficult you can do a patellar snip you can do a VY quadriceps plasty. Most people don't like it anymore. But uh, the tibial, long tibial osteotomy is gradually gaining favor because it, after doing a long, but when you do it, it should be at least two to three inches. That is about six to eight centimeters minimum. You lift the tibial tubercle with, with the long osteotomy, lift it up. After you've done the procedure, you put it back. You can put it back with wires or screws or whatever. But that is now gradually gaining more uh, favor than even the SNP. But if it's a minor issue, SNP is a fairly good procedure. You have now exposed. Now comes to remove the prosthesis. First thing and easiest to remove, in this case it was broken. But otherwise the easiest thing after you expose nicely, the gutters are exposed, this is done. Now look, here is the tibial pin I was talking to you about. You put in a pin here. And this pin 
will make sure that when you reflect or revert the patella, the patella tendon doesn't easily come off. If you're too harsh, it can still, you know, do it, or the pin can cut through. But if you're careful, this is one easy way of preventing further damage to the patella tendon. However, once you have removed the meniscus, you've made some working maneuvering space. It's up to you. You want to go first to the tibia or femur. We normally go towards the femur first because to remove the tibia, either you have to put uh, something at the back hair and push it all forward or you have not enough room to work especially into the posterior lateral corner which is all rather deep stuck and adherent. So you can use with thin osteotomes, a jiggly saw. These are two cheap things with which you can do 95 to 98 percent and you need 100% patience to do this. Then comes high speed burrs and then comes the so called Midas Rex kind of things. That is if you are doing about 2000 and you have enough money, that's expensive stuff. But it's a good thing if you have it. But this is how we actually do. We, we've exposed this. You go to one side. This is the lateral side. Here you can see the cement is breaking up. You take a thin osteotome, not in a hurry, start gradually breaking the cement, bone cement interface and then you can take a jiggly saw here, put it and pull it up towards the metal so that you are going away from bone and gradually go down. Quite often the posterior part feels very stuck. It is also stuck because it gets jammed on the upper part of tibia. In which case you extend the femur a bit and you will find it is loosening up and you can knock a bit with the osteotome at the bottom and when you get this out, this is fairly neat believe you that there is hardly any bone stuck to it. Uh, this, is, this is what you are looking for, not taking any bone out with the implant. Then comes the tibial implant. For the tibial implant, you have to go first to the posterior lateral corner. Before that, there will be quite a bit of this tissue which is formed. I do not know whether it is fibrous tissue or what, but it is sort of fibrous tissue. Use a diathermy, remove all this and you can then Sometimes it gets very difficult to remove it by just knocking it. There have been mentions of actually using a Midas Rex for an uncemented knee to try and decapitate the stem. This is for a theory question, but practically just knock it a bit harder. That is it. It usually will come out if it is actually loose and if it is not loose, then it is not the right thing to do. You should not have been doing it anyway. So nonetheless, the goal of is to remove the implant and preserve bone stock. Here you are for the tibia. This was a broken one. We got it from somewhere. I don't know which this one was. But nonetheless, you see in all these, you can see my pin is there intact to hold the patellar ligament so that it doesn't evolve. I think it's the IB. Uh, well, so anyway, so we took this out. We gradually, then from that corner, we used the jiggly saw, cleared the base and knocked it out. This has got, again, minimal bone on one of the condyles. In spite of all this, then you have the patella. What do you do with the patella? We have so far removing these things. It's If it is a dome design, it normally will run on most of the implants that you put back. And I suspect if it is your own, then you are going to likely to put the same design back. This is if it is aseptic, then if it is well fixed, there is no evidence whatsoever. You may consider leaving it alone. If it needs removal, all you need to do is very, very carefully. You can use burrs and things. There is usually a fibrous membrane around it, which first this fibrous membrane, first thing is to debride this. Then at the interface, gradually start, you either use a jiggly saw or a fine osteotome, then gradually knock it out. And in this, in spite of everything, this was the first picture, you are left with the hole. We just left it alone like that. It, it does not really bother much. So which goes back to prove to replace or not to replace. Anyway, finally, we have to think in terms of fitting a new prosthesis and when you put a new prosthesis after removing something, you actually do not have the same virgin territory that you are playing with. You have lax tissues, you have an uncertain amount of balance which is left behind. It is not what you have created. In a primary knee, you create a sort of a gap. In this, you are given a gap and then you do the job. In a primary knee, you make a gap and then you put the implant. So nonetheless, here you need to restore the joint line. What is the joint line? Joint line is where the upper end of tibia or the lower end of femur should be. 
and the upper end of tibia should be about a centimeter and a half above this tip of the fibula. Lower end of femoral same should be this is the medial side 3 centimeters below this let the, the and the lateral side 2 and a half centimeters. So, the difference is 5 millimeters and if you think with a cool head that is the 3 to 5 degrees external rotation that is how you keep this in your mind. And you, once you got you got restore the joint line after you put the trial implants you must get proper flexion extension gaps and these will only be proper if you have got the joint line right. You cannot leave a huge gap and stick in a 25 millimeter plastic that is cool because that will alter the patellar biomechanics, patellar femoral, you will get patella, patella uh, baha and you will start getting wear and discomfort from day one. And other thing is once you put the trials, you should be able to get at least about 90 degrees flexion on the table and if it is very tight, you can actually do pie crusting even of the, of the quadriceps tendon. Two basic cuts on the distal femoral side, now that you have got an idea, you have got all cuts should be redone once you have removed the implant, all cuts should be redone. Sometimes it is very lucrative to just pick up an implant and fit it in and it fits beautifully and your colleagues nearby say, wow, that is wonderful. Now that is not wonderful because you have got to do it all over again as if nothing has been done and also make sure that the joint line is built up and if you find that you are too high from the epicondyle, you have got to put distal augments. You have got to bring it down to get a proper uh, this thing. Second thing is also you got to get your proper valgus angle, usually 5 to 7 degrees, default can be 6, 6 degrees a proper valgus for the femur. Uh, as I said, look for epicondyles and if you can't find them, I have told you the other things. Now, this friend is one of the most helpful places where computer assisted surgery comes in hand. I am only referring to that, I am not yet a fan of PSI, the patient specific instrumentation and I really do not think I am going to become one because I find that it is a little over the top, but with CAS you have got real good reason to look at it. It helps you bypass a lot of landmarks which you do not have left. Tibial jig similarly for the femur it is the intramedullary jig or CAS. For the tibia you will it is better to rely on the extramedullary jig. Again put it on top, remove, go up one side will be more worn out the other will be less. Remove, go to the less side and above that see the other side and just shave off, just shave off from the what is left behind. Do not remove any healthy bone after that is done then you build it up and then you have to build up the rectangular gap using augments etc and in this case you can see we put the distal augment here you can see this distal augment with cement because the joint line was not proper so we had to get the extension space sorted out by putting this flexion space was quite all right and you don't put too thick 12 and a half millimeters is normally our cutoff point I think in many, many, many knees, I won't guess numbers, but certainly in, uh, in three figures of these kind of revisions, we have maybe used 15 millimeters in initial some cases. We are absolutely, uh, you know, I told them they should be in the OT. You can't be so confident, but put them in such a corner that retrieving them is a pain so that you don't use them. And normally we use, after we put all this in, then you check the stability, you check at various uh, angles that is before you cement it in check this if you still find flexion extension gap mismanagement that is a chapter it has been discussed in various talks today but it is a separate chapter altogether make sure that the alignment is correct the patellar tracking is good and now the knee is ready for a fix uh, it is up to you you can cement it you can I am here I am using the uncemented and I am quite comfortable in uh, putting the whole thing together, but if you have any doubt then do it one by one. If there is any doubt about instability, do it one by one. The post-operatively, we, we do not in primaries normally use CPM except in a complex primary where it is a post-traumatic situation. In a couple of cases we have even done in post-tubercular where there are adhesions in rheumatoid which have been severely fixed for a long time and in fussy patients who will not move it themselves. 
and in some patients who like something to be done unnecessarily. So, but normally we don't need to use it. And we have uh, the results in revisions will depend on the severity of the problem, the quality of soft tissues and bone. Good results are expected in 50 to 80 percent. Complications are 15 to 30 percent. This is not just for you, it is for what you are supposed to convey to your patient. And if all of you told them 50 to 30, then believe me, you will go all over and come back to you again. So if you think you are going to say my complication rate is 3 percent, then you will have 30 people waiting knocking outside your door. It's best everybody maintain the correct information and 10 years survival is about 72 percent versus 95 percent in primary knee replacements. This is a, a complex primary. Why I put this slide lastly is not to show the what we have managed to do. This is to show you that if you are going to do anything like that, be prepared to do a revision knee replacement. This is not a primary knee replacement. And by the way, this is about four or five years down the line. Few months ago, she has probably come back infected. So this is a very sobering thing. While we have celebrated this wonderful x-ray, very good result. Everything she had, this fracture came from somewhere. We removed all this metal and did this. And we thought, wow, look what we have done. So, but and I think that this is likely to be. This is what I think it is. And this was the one which I had shown you. This one had come from somewhere with this broken implant. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> Uh, the, the tibial tubercle loss okay. yes I mean you there is no problem I normally avoid it I am not uh, it just adds time to my work I am too lazy to go ahead and do it but if I can't get out of it I think that is what I am mentally prepared to do and uh, snip but after you do a snip then don't do this also you know you can't you know break it from both hands choose one you got to make up your mind but normally we have got away with a snip and maybe a bit of a compromise once in a while an osteotomy, but I am now more and more inclined towards doing that because the results I am listening to and seeing from people appear to be encouraging. No, no, I have no faith in lag screws in, uh, in this kind of a situation. I need something which is going to take the load. I am going to use straightforward wires, metal wires or cable, whatever you, cheap wires, three of them <coughs> going all around the tibia. No, no smartness. It has to be done that way yet. So, if I am getting convinced on one hand that osteotomy is good, I am equally convinced because I do a lot of ETOs for the femur. I have a reasonable experience in doing ETOs with the femur and fixing them back with the wires and no regret. So, I am going to go. Screws somehow always worry me, especially if you want to get them mobilized quickly. Yes, sir. Then uh, around the this thing and then putting it back. Make, make a sort of a like in the olecran and you go okay. partial this thing. Yeah. Loop it up. Yeah. No, no, no. Loop it through the bone and fix it out. Yeah. No, 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 no. You wouldn't want to go that way. Uh, wrong use of terminology. Thank you for correcting. No. No, 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 no. I don't do uncemented. By the way, I don't do uncemented. I've done two. One was a demonstration in the Asia Pacific meeting which I conducted in Delhi and one was the another patient. I have done hybrids in young patients where the femur was uncemented and femur has such a nice chamfer, it is a good quality. But to answer your question, what should be the indications? I was when I was referring to and while you were having a bit of a snooze, I was referring to uh, the uncemented stem, not to the uncemented implant. In fact, this whole thing about, did you hear about Pamela Anderson? Yeah, that was to wake you up actually, <laughs> that was to wake you up. Actually, actually I looked at you and I started, but nonetheless, never mind, all said and done, that's what I said. What are your principles with space? Do you use articulating cement or do you sterilize metal one? Yeah, I, we, we have done this and I am quite happy uh, with, uh, I shape the, the spacer and I, uh, I have uh, yet not had a patient where I thought that I might just leave it in. We have always decided we are going to do it again. And those are the ones we picked up. We are molding it to that shape, rough, ugly shape, but it's working. And we change it back. And if we are finding that, say, eight weeks or ten weeks, we still 
they are not controlled, then in three instances I have to go back and do a read every month. But that is better than hoping that you know a longer stay will make it all right. So that that is the only advantage I thought that. But and second thing is the cost mm -hmm. is a huge difference. We often take shelter of cost to answer something what we are doing. But in this case, I am very comfortable. Uh, Modes are very expensive. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. We well, they uh, we have to we have about five hundred dollars worth of a prostalac available, yeah. and the mold would be somewhere about uh, 150 odd dollars and the bone cement uh, would be about uh, what but uh? uh, cemented uh, the antibiotic loaded will be about 50 dollars There are various ways of doing it. There is way one is that if you are saying flexion gap is loose, so to reduce the flexion gap, the flexion gap is in singularly affected by the two ways flexion gap can be improved. If I went for the tibial side alone, then either I raise the tibia and push the femur back a bit and then put an insert. So what I have done is I have re reduced the uh, flexion, increased the extension and then put so that I have balanced it. Other way is I actually push the uh, femoral implant posteriorly. Now it depends how much is the yawn, how big is it opening like that. It will all depend on that. So depending uh, there can, oh, this can be one instance, this is by far the most common situation which you will come across. And in this the worst case scenario and very rarely will have to be uh, a constrained implant. This is the only indication where you are not able to balance this properly. There is only that much you can build up or reflect, but the aim is either you lift, you have to only know three principles which we heard. One, if you do the distal femur, you are affecting extension. If you do the upper tibia, you are affecting flexion and extension. If you do the posterior femur, you are affecting only flexion. So you can't just build up the uh, tibia, you will start, you will get the flexion better, but your extension won't be full. So if I have to compromise, I have to get my extension right, however I get it. No, that is that won't. That then you've got to work it out. You've got to work it out. The need for a posterior release in a revision is extremely rare. It's only highly academic, written somewhere in 1832 or something. I don't know when, but you hardly need to do that. Yeah. Or you have to choose between elevating the joint line a little bit higher. If the larger implant is really not totally floating off the bone, hey, then at the larger implant is better. However, however, one must remember the mistake we often make is when we remove the implants, we are tempted to put one size smaller. Please do it should be your target to put the biggest possible doesn't mean it and preferably the size that was removed if the previous size was appropriate. So do not try to fit that because you have removed bone, it looks narrower, it becomes this thing and you quickly put a one size smaller and sometimes that fits even without cuts and that's very dangerous because it will look it's very nice, two good blows it will go and sit also very nicely but you don't know where the joint line is, you don't know what is the valgus angle that you picked up, you don't know how much bone you have destroyed and you don't know what stability you have. So as I said you will have to go step by step and you must get the biggest possible size which fits properly. After this there is a charge. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, what is the role of metaphysical cones and how does it work? Like they, I, uh, this is a rich city, I forgot yeah, that I the kings have left a lot of money here. Now, the point is this, that's very nice, it's excellent and uh, that is, uh, that is huge gaps which you can't uh, build with, you can't build huge gaps with cement. Mind you, don't try to create a situation where you pump in cement and then you just put a joint on it. It will look very nice on the x-ray on day one. It will look good for a few weeks, months, maybe years, but then you are in trouble. Cones and this are very good to reconstruct and bring it down where you have to. So in a way to answer your question that if it is a huge gap and you can do nothing about it, then that is that's another step you can think of the cones, you can keep the cones ready and in sleeves and cones can be used 
as an extreme step with extreme cost. They, they are pretty good actually. They give huge amount of stability very quickly and good mobility. We do use them at times. We use sleeves, we have used more and uh, we don't have too much experience with cones yet, but they, I believe, will do very well. They'll do well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else before we move on? Yeah. That's uh, the case that you're talking about. I would usually go straight to a retaining unit. Yeah, It's basically why he's putting this up. The choice of an implant in these regional situations. If you've got everything, there are consider it four things: anterior, posterior, cruciate. You, you consider the two, uh, the two collaterals on the side, and you con and you consider the patellar, the extensor mechanism. If out of all this, only the medial structures are not good for fun, if all are functional. You can use whatever you like. If only the medial structures are damaged, then you can use crochet sacrifices. If these are there is bone laxity and you need some more stability on similar basis, at the moment moment uh, with PCL you have some uh, this thing on the lateral collateral, you can think of a constraint. If you go a step further, if you've got Except the patellar ligament, extensor mechanism functional, everything else damaged, you go for a rotating inch or less constraint, but with foam and sleeve, but sleeve, not foam. And if everything is gone, you have nothing but a rigid inch, which in long term is bad news, just short of two. So this is the basic principle how you decide which of these implants you are going to use and sleeve and Thank you very much. Last speaker, Jim Magrofte. Uh, uh, Jim works at the Imperial College, so he's got access to the latest technology in London. And he's going to take us through the future of uh, the arthroplasty. I'm sure we're going to hear about robotics and PSI and uh, probably new gadgets. You will. I'm just trying to load up the videos that go with this. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, <laughs> Where's the desktop on it? You just need to. Where's the desktop? Yeah, there's a desktop. Yeah, but I want to. Yeah, there's a desktop. Yeah, there's a desktop. You know in the file there's um, a 